If you can't run as fast or jump as high as you'd like to, blame your parents. Good morning. Happy Wednesday. I have neural coffee in hand and it is perfect. All right, Wednesday. Tomorrow, 6 a.m., Thursday, Coffee and Coaches Conference call. Please join us. The last few calls have been outstanding. Big group last time. Looking forward to, to tomorrow morning already. All right, with that in mind, it's Wednesday, so it's always tight in the morning if we got to crank this one out. Okay, let's go to the Q&A. This comes from Malty. Or, I'm sorry, Malty. Malty was uh, um, on the... Uh, Coffee and Coaches Conference call last week, and she comes in with a question. She says, I have a client that's a high-level field athlete who frequently suffers from hamstring strains and occasional hip flexor tightness. He's gone through a lot of PT with fairly inconsistent results. Is there anything that I should be especially aware of in terms of his potential compensations? It seems like coaching a posterior tilt has just been beaten to death with this guy and has not done much help. Okay, so we gotta think about this for a second as to what being a field athlete entails. And I'm gonna, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm gonna oversimplify this to a massive degree. We're talking about multifactorial issues here out the wazoo, but but let's let's narrow this down. So I have a situation where I have to change direction, I have to accelerate, and then I have to achieve top speed. So we're gonna talk about those three things. And so to do that, I have to be able to change the configuration of my pelvis to achieve these outcomes. And so let me grab the pelvis here. And so what I'm talking about is, is when, we, when we raise and lower the center of gravity, um, uh, when we're changing direction or accelerating or, or top speed, the, the pelvis actually has to change its configuration. So top speed configuration is actually gonna be biased a little bit more towards what, what we would see in, in uh, say like a, a narrow ISA type of thing. We're gonna be biased a little bit towards that, that inhaled position. As I lower my center of gravity, I have to apply greater forces into the ground. I'm gonna move towards that, that exhale position. So my ability to move through these, these orientations is, is kind of a big, big deal. Now, with a field athlete though, you're gonna have a bias that's gonna tilt that pelvis forward. So we'll see this in a lot of, lot of explosive and really, really fast athletes. Because they have to apply so much force into the ground, because that's where your, where your, your force production is, is going to be, right? So we have to, I have to capture as much internal rotation as I possibly can. So if I anteriorly orient my pelvis, I can push harder into the ground. So my change of direction is better, my acceleration is better, my top speed is better. And so again, so this is one of those situations where if I just try to drive somebody into this, this symmetrical posterior tilt in an attempt to alleviate um, some, some measure of, of the so-called hip flexor tightness, um, you're probably gonna fail because what you're gonna end up doing is you're gonna get this full posterior orientation of the pelvis as a single unit. So we're not gonna get relative position changes that we would wanna see in regards to our, our performance on, on, the, on the field but you're gonna see a lumbar flexion substitution and this full pelvis orientation. So what I would recommend under these circumstances when you're trying to make a favorable change um, in, in these field athletes is to use something that is, that is asymmetrical. So um, you're also probably gonna see a lot of compressive strategies. So they're gonna get that posterior lower compression. These people have limited hip flexion and so we can't move people into even a hook line position or, or something where the hips will be bent 90 degrees. So we're gonna start with something that's a little bit more close to, to full extension. And so this is where the, like your supine cross connects come into, into play. It's a great place to start. We can actually use the compensatory strategy to our advantage to recapture um, some of the, the, the internal rotation, AKA hip extension by tradition which will alleviate some of the, the pelvic orientation issues that might be producing some of the hamstring issues as well as the hip flexor tightness. And then we want to move you into something that would be more like the, the prone propulsive strategies. And then we're going to move this upward into a standing activity where we'll go through a whole progression of A marches, A skips, etc. cetera, um, to, to try to teach them how to control this orientation in a dynamic environment. But Malti, what your question has led me to is let's look at some structural issues um, that we might be able to utilize to tweak training a little bit more um, where we can identify these, these performance related biases by physical structure. So this is actually kind of interesting. Um, I haven't really talked about this a, a whole lot. And so what we want to do is we want to take a look at the entire configuration of the axial skeleton. So, so this is not about the archetypes per se. 
Um, what this is going to be is, is a structural relationship in, in physical diameter of thorax to pelvis because we, we, have, we have certain advantages and disadvantages based on our structure, which is why I led in with this whole comment about blame your parents for everything because they're the ones that gave you, gave you your structure. So if we look at the differential between a, a thorax and the pelvis, what we have is, is fluid pressure and, and velocity mechanics in play here. And so, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to break this up into, into three. I'll give you three representations. There's more than there's more than three, but but again, I'm going to use these as as um, something to, to sort of get us started on the, on this level of discussion. So let's just say that I have a thorax that is that is narrower in in circumference that, than the pelvis. So we're going to call this this a a, a narrow to wide uh, configuration. What happens internally with the internal mechanics is I have a gradient bias that is downward, which means that it's easier for me to to push push my guts downward. So there's a higher velocity that's driving me into the ground right away. And what this is going to do as an athlete is that it's going to increase the, the duration of my ground contact times. And so that means that I'm also going to have a lesser upward velocity. So I'm going to be a little bit more challenged in that regard. It doesn't mean it can't be fast. It doesn't mean I can't perform it at very, very high levels. We're just, we're talking about biases here. Um, so, but what it's going to do, it's going to give me better side to side agility. It's easy for me to move the internal forces from side to side, but it's going to steal my top speed. Um, because again, I, I, for top speed, you've got to be able to throw the guts up into the air as you're bouncing across the ground. It's just harder to do in this configuration. But because my ground contact times are a little bit longer, I might have good acceleration. Um, it steals my vertical jump a little bit. Um, which again, um, I don't know how important that is when, when I'm a field athlete because again, it, it, it just depends on what type of a position player that I'm going to be. Now, if we looked at this kind of in the gym, it's like, let's just take a box squat. We're gonna apply this box squat to everybody. Um, how would I bias this box squat to enhance my ability to perform on, on the field? I'm gonna use a reverse band box squat. What the reverse band is gonna do is it's actually gonna help me accelerate those guts upwards, gonna train me to do that. And, and so there's there's a way that, that you can bias the training. So I write one training program for all my field athletes, but I can bias it um, directly for each individual athlete so they benefit from this. So the reverse band is gonna help me elevate the guts because that's my greatest challenge. Now, if I go to a wide circumference in the thorax and a narrow circumference of the pelvis, now my gradient bias is upward. So this is gonna reduce my ground contact times and it's gonna increase my upward velocity. So these are, these are the people that tend to stand out as, as athletes because um, what this does is it does gives me better top speed. I have a lesser acceleration, but but because my top speed is so good, I tend to make up for the lack of acceleration. So these people look good under almost every circumstance. Um, they, they don't have as great a change of direction um, like, our, like our, our person with the, with the wider relative circumference of the pelvis. But once again, it's like they just make up for it with top speed. If I want to apply this in the gym, I'm gonna and, and I'm writing my program, and everybody's doing a box squat that day, um, I'm gonna have this guy just do a regular good old box squat. The basic premise here is you've got somebody that has a configuration that makes them an outstanding athlete by most people's perspective. Just don't screw them up. So now let's take a look at somebody that that is that is a wide circumference of the thorax and a wide circumference of the pelvis. Now in this situation, I have a relative similarity between the, the upper and lower part of the axial skeleton. So I don't have a gradient bias where I would see the velocity changes internally um, that I would see with the other two configurations. So what this means is, is that I got a guy that can probably produce a heck of a lot of force, but it takes him time to do so. Um, so again, this guy is going to be a guy that, that is really good at moving other people around. He can produce a lot of force. He doesn't get moved around a lot um, in and of, of himself. Um, but because he, he needs more time to produce the force, he's not the fastest guy on, on the field. Um, he might be still a great athlete, but again, he's not gonna have the greatest vertical jump. He's not gonna have great top speed. He's not gonna have great acceleration, but again, he, he's a great positional person. Under these circumstances, what I wanna do is I wanna teach this guy to, to, to throw his guts up as much as he possibly can. So if I take this guy into the gym, what I'm gonna do with this box squat under these circumstances, I'm gonna do a banded squat because I want what I wanna do is I wanna teach him to create the rebound of the guts off that the, the pelvic outlet as much as possible to create as much 
um, for us as I can in the shortest possible amount of time. And so hopefully that gives you an, an idea of how this structural stuff actually does influence the level of performance. And all we have to do is, is understand how these, these influences affect um, top speed, acceleration, changes of direction, and we can tweak programs to individualize it for their physical structure. If you have any other questions, please send them to askbillhartman at gmail.com, askbillhartman at gmail.com. Uh, tomorrow, coffee and coaches conference call, and I will see you guys then, 6 a.m. See ya.